Hi everyone, I'm Dan Freed, creator of Biochemistry Literacy. I'm also a chemistry professor and I have a PhD from Yale. This program has been developed for over 10 years and thousands of students have already participated. If this is your first time, I'm very happy that you have joined us. Uh, before we begin lesson one, it's very important that you have on hand a model set like this custom Molly Mod set that's available from my website. And you also need to print out the guided notes and especially the periodic table. Uh, this is going to be very important as we proceed with the lessons and always have your periodic table uh, no matter which lesson we are in. So without further ado, let's get started. Now in lesson one, we're going to be introducing all the components of the program and we're going to be focusing on our first molecules, the gas molecules which surround us and our first biomolecule, hemoglobin. Before we begin, please pause the video and take this pretest. If you don't know some of the answers, it's fine. Just leave them blank or make a good guess. You'll be amazed how much you know by the end of the lesson. Cells are much bigger than molecules. Cells are made of molecules. Cells are alive. Cells are something you can see in a microscope. This is an example of a cell. This is an amoeba cell. And if this was a video, it could be moving around and you would see its little lifestyle. You can see in the center there's a nucleus. You can see the pseudopods, which are like the false feet projections. These are cells. Here's another example of cells, algae cells. These are rectangular and they're also very rigid and strong because they're surrounded by a cell wall. Inside those cells, we can see those little green circles. Those are the chloroplasts. That's what creates the photosynthesis of plants. And here's a third kind of cells, yeast cells. Yeast are a kind of fungi. And these cells can grow and multiply. They're made of an enormous amount of molecules. And the goal of this lesson, and also of the entire course, is to familiarize yourself with what those biomolecules are. What are the molecules that make life possible? Now a centerpiece of the entire program is the periodic table. The periodic table is going to be the key that's going to unlock chemistry for us. We're going to be able to learn why atoms behave the way they are and why they form the molecules that they do. Now the periodic table that I use is going to look a little bit different from the periodic table that you've seen in books before. My periodic table has moved helium from the right side to the left side. In lesson three it's going to become very obvious why I'm using a periodic table, that's the style. But for now, just trust me that we're going to be using helium on the left side. The other interesting thing about the periodic table that we can learn about is its overall shape. The one very obvious and strange thing about the periodic table as it's drawn here is that there are certain elements kind of stuck on the bottom, separated from the rest of the periodic table. Why is that? Is there any scientific reason for that? The answer is no. If we look at how the elements are numbered, numbers 55, 56, and then 57 are kind of separated out for some reason. So why do we go from 55, 56 to 71? Why is 57 stuck down on the bottom there? Well, the reason for this is simply to save space. The true periodic table should have what's called the F block, which is the blue box that I just inserted there. The F block really should be in this position. Now we can see that the elements 55, 56, 57, 58, and 59, now they're all in the correct order. This, what we're seeing right here, is the true periodic table. It's very long. All the elements are now in their correct orders. The only reason that we put the F block on the bottom is to save space. No other reason. It's not because the elements on the bottom are artificial or because they're, some of them are radioactive. It's simply to save space. So we're learning a few little secrets about the periodic table that you maybe didn't know before. Now many of the students who enroll in this course have a natural interest in the periodic table. So if you don't already know about it, check out the P-Table website where you can look at the periodic table in different forms and get all kinds of uh, extra information about the elements. Now this periodic table from P-Table shows the classic arrangement of elements with helium on the right side. The reason that most periodic tables show helium on the right side is because helium is a noble gas, which means that it does not bond to other elements generally. Helium, neon, argon, krypton, those are the noble gases. Those are the purple elements on the right side. So that's the classic periodic table. The elements are grouped in terms of their properties or their behaviors. If we look at a different form of the periodic table from that very same website, we see something that's a little bit more similar to the one that we're using in this course. Here, 
helium is drawn on the left side next to hydrogen. That's because this periodic table is all about showing electron orbitals. And again, in lesson three, we get our introduction to electron orbitals. It makes a lot of sense to put helium and hydrogen together because they belong to the same electron filling orbital or block. So depending on what you're trying to express in your periodic table, you may draw it in different ways. Now there are actually many alternative ways of drawing the periodic table and you can do some research on your own if you're interested in learning more. We have this spiral version of the periodic table. We have this uh, strange tower version of the periodic table. And these are all just different strategies of showing the same thing. But again, we're emphasizing different things and we're trying to express something different in the way that we draw our periodic table. We're now going to introduce the most important elements in biochemistry and we're also going to color our periodic table so that we can remember the color coding for each of these elements. Hydrogen, which is element number one, is represented as a, either a light gray or a white atom piece. If you look at your model sets, the white atoms are the hydrogens. So go ahead and color in, maybe in a very light pencil shade, the hydrogen box so that you can always remember that hydrogen is the white atom piece. Carbon, which is element number six, is represented by a black atom piece or sometimes a dark gray atom. Nitrogen, which is element number seven, is represented by the blue atom pieces. Oxygen is represented by the red and fluorine is represented by light green. You will find some light green fluorines in your model set, even though fluorine is not very common in biomolecules. Some of the other very important elements in biology are phosphorus, sulfur, chlorine, iron, and many more, but these are the elements that you have represented in your model set. However, in your model sets, the phosphorus, rather than being orange, is purple. Now the reason for this is that there's actually two competing ideas of what color phosphorus should be represented by. Uh, don't worry about it too much, but if you are interested in it, you can go ahead and look up the CPK color coding scheme, which is where these color codes came from. Now, if you haven't done so already, pause this video and take some time to neatly color your periodic table with these different colors so that you can remember which atoms go with which color. It's worth noting that the atoms themselves are not actually these colors. Oxygen is not actually red. Nitrogen is not actually blue. These are just the colors we use in the models. We're now going to begin discovering the world of 3D biomolecules by using the free molecular modeling software, PyMol. You're gonna be able to open all the files that I'm showing you in the presentation by downloading the software. If you need directions on how to do it, uh, check out lesson zero and just follow along if you don't have PyMol. Now that we've been introduced to the atom color coding, we can look at a big biomolecule like this hemoglobin protein and recognize what atoms it's made out of. It's made out of lots of hydrogens, which are white, lots of carbons, which are dark gray, many nitrogens, which are the blue, lots of red oxygens, and a few yellow sulfurs. And if you look very closely, you can see that dark brown color for some irons, which we're gonna be focusing on very soon. Now, if you go to lesson one in the website, you can actually see the PyMol file that I'm gonna be using in this little demonstration. If you go ahead and click on the hemoglobin.pse file and you have PyMol installed, the hemoglobin molecule that I'm showing you will pop up on your screen and you can actually explore the molecule the same way that I'm about to do. Now, once you load hemoglobin in PyMol, you should see this kind of a picture. This is hemoglobin. It's a very large protein and it's made of a lot of the atoms that we've talked about so far, it's made of carbons, nitrogens, oxygens, hydrogens, a few other atoms. What we're gonna do now is look for some patterns. Now when I'm teaching this to a class, we actually will explore the structure for quite some time and we'll kind of try to find some structures that seem to be repeating themselves or sort of patterns that kind of jump out at us as we explore the structure. So there's all different ways you can go with this, but what I wanna focus you on is to look at the number of connections to each atom, the number of bonds that each atom is capable of making. So let's first look at this carbon atom right here. There's a carbon atom, a gray atom, so that we, that's the way we know it's carbon. And we're gonna count how many bonds this atom has to it. So here's our atom. It's connected to one, two, three, four other atoms, okay? It's connected to three hydrogens and one carbon. Great, let's look now at the next carbon. Let's look at this carbon here. How many atoms is that carbon connected to? One, two, 
three, four. Also four. Hmm, interesting. No matter where we look, and no matter what kind of bonds we're dealing with, we're always going to have a carbon that has four bonds. Even this bond uh, here, this, this atom here, which has a double bond, it has two bonds connecting the same atom, right? We have two connections to this oxygen, one connection to that nitrogen, and one to that carbon. Nothing else underneath, that's four bonds. So again, carbon is found to have four bonds. So that's our first rule that we're going to learn as part of this course, that carbon makes four bonds. It'll basically always make four bonds. So no matter where we look in this gigantic structure, we'll always find carbons with four bonds. Even this strange one over here, let's look over here, we see some double bonded carbons. Now this is, by the way, this is another pattern that you may find. Students often find patterns. This pattern of double, single, double, single, double, single, that's another sort of pattern that we'll learn about later in the course. That's called an aromatic ring. But no matter which carbon we choose, this carbon here, double bonded to one carbon, single bonded to a carbon, single bonded to a hydrogen, that's four bonds total. Now while we're here, let's investigate the hydrogens. This is a very easy one to look at the hydrogens. Each hydrogen has only one bond connecting it, right? This hydrogen has one bond, this hydrogen has one bond. I will actually never find a hydrogen that has more than one bond to it. So that's another pattern or kind of rule or law that you might find. Here's a bunch of uh, hydrogens right here. None of them have more than one bond. So in your model kit, the white hydrogens are going to be used only to connect to one other atom. We do have the two-hold hydrogens, and that's used to simulate another phenomena called hydrogen bonding, which is not actually a stable uh, covalent bond. So don't get distracted by the number of holes in the atom pieces. We have to go by the rules that we observe from nature here. Okay? So we know that carbons make four bonds, Ox uh, hydrogens made one. Let's now go down the periodic table to the nitrogens. Let's look at a, a nitrogen-rich area here. Again, the blue atoms are the nitrogens. And do we see any patterns with these nitrogens? Here we have a whole bunch of nitrogens in our field of view here. Do we notice anything about all those nitrogens? Do they have something in common? Yes, they do. All these nitrogens have only three bonds connecting them. This nitrogen has one, two, three. Okay, it's connected to two, bo uh, two atoms, but there are three bonds altogether. This nitrogen has one, two, three atoms connecting it. This Nitrogen over here also has one, two, three atoms connecting it. Now, by the way, you might notice that I'm using the mouse commands. I'm using some different mouse commands here. Um, many of them are outlined in the video, but you can use the right mouse button to zoom in and out. The middle mouse button moves us around. It pans us, and then the left one kind of uh, makes uh, different angles of view here. There's a couple other tricks that you might want to know. If you go to the edge here and hold down on the left mouse button key, you can actually rotate the whole scene. And the other really useful one is to make a single click with your scroll wheel. If you make a single click, it centers the field of view in a different way. Watch this again. Single click, it centers our view in a different way, and then we can kind of look around uh, and, and have a more easy time of seeing where we're trying to look at. Uh, the one other thing to know about is using our scroll wheel, and that sort of gives us a different angle of view and kind of helps us um, isolate the scene that we're looking at. Okay, so anyway, our rules. Carbons have four bonds. Nitrogens have three bonds. Hydrogens had one bond. The last one to look at are the oxygens. Here's an oxygen. That oxygen has how many bonds altogether? two bonds. It's got a double bond. It is connected to only one other atom, but it's a double bond, so there's two atoms there. Uh, let's see if I can find a few other um, uh, oxygens. By the way, this, this is another pattern that you'll see. It's not, it's not the pattern that we're looking for right here, but this pattern of C, O with a double bond, N, H with a single bond, that's a pattern. You notice that there's a lot of those. Here's another one. Interesting. So we're seeing even more patterns. There's another one of the same thing. Those seem to be everywhere, right? That's really interesting. So we're going to learn about that. That's called a peptide bond. We cover that in later chapters also. So the bottom line here is that this world of biochemistry is much less complicated than it looks. There's a lot of patterns, and once you um, get a, a feel for those patterns, 
your life's a lot easier and you can really uh, understand what's going on. Here's another kind of oxygen. This oxygen has uh, only two bonds, right? It's bonded to one hydrogen and one carbon. That's the general rule that we're going to find with oxygens. It's not the complete rule. We're going to learn about some other um, subtleties to that later, but that's the general rule. Wherever you see an, uh, an, an oxygen, you're usually going to find two bonds, okay? So again, looking at the whole rule here, carbons make four bonds, nitrogens make three bonds, and oxygens make two bonds. Hydrogens also make one bond. We won't find any fluorines here, so um, we're going to look at the behavior of a fluorine later on. All right, so that's our view of our hemoglobin. Oh, there's one other atom that I forgot to mention. The last one is the sulfur. Let's kind of take, take a look at the sulfur. Sulfurs are much rarer. We're not going to talk too much about sulfurs today, but there's a sulfur. Let's see if we can see anything about sulfurs that is a pattern. Let's look at the sulfur here. Just kind of, uh, there is a learning curve with the mouse, so you will get better at using the mouse. There's our sulfur. How many bonds does that sulfur have? One, two. It's bonded to two other atoms. Let's go find one other sulfur so we can establish a pattern here. Here's one over here, and it's a different kind. Let's zoom in here. Okay, there's another one. How many bonds does that sulfur have? Two. It's another rule that's popped out at us. So again, now that we have um, gone from seeing this hemoglobin structure as almost impossibly complex, maybe something that you could never get any grasp of or get your head around at all. We've already, um, just using our own observations, you know, just a, a, any, any a kid can do this, you've found lots of different patterns and the world's gotten a little bit simpler. And now we can maybe start to understand why these patterns exist. In lessons three and four, we get to the bottom of why these patterns exist. Why does carbon make four bonds? Why does nitrogen generally make three bonds? Why does oxygen generally make two bonds, all right? So that's our little um, 3D exploration, uh, what I call a molecular field trip into the world of hemoglobin. Now jumping back to our presentation, let's now summarize the number of bonds that we observed in the atoms in the hemoglobin structure. First, we noticed that carbons always make four bonds. We also noticed that nitrogens make three bonds. They almost always make three bonds. We will see some exceptions to that, but for now we're going to learn that nitrogens make three bonds. And in all the building that you do in these first lessons, only use three out of those four holes for making your connections to the other atoms. We remember that oxygen had two bonds. Generally, we saw the, um, the OH as a common pattern and also the O double bond carbon as another sort of common pattern. Two bonds for our oxygens generally, although there will be some other subtleties to learn there. Don't use all four holes in the oxygen pieces in your kit, just use two for now. And then the last one, the simplest one, hydrogens make one bond. Again, even though if there's two holes in some of those hydrogen pieces in your kit, only use one of those for a bond. At this point, you can take out your guided notes and start filling in some of these charts. This chart is just designed to help reinforce the patterns that we've discovered by looking through the pymol structure. Hydrogens make one bond. Their symbol is H and their color is white. Carbons are black, symbolized by a C, and they make four bonds. Nitrogens are blue. Their symbol is N and they typically make three bonds. Oxygens make two bonds and they're red and their symbol is O. Now, we didn't actually observe any fluorines in the structure, but if you look at your periodic table, you're going to notice that a pattern is arising. If we look at the periodic table, the order of the elements is carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, neon. I'm looking at the order of the periodic table there. Could you make a guess about how many bonds fluorines make? And remember, chemistry is all about patterns. Pause the video for a minute and think about it, or if you're in a group, you can discuss, or if you're a teacher, you can ask the class what they think the number of bonds for a fluorine is. But if you are into these patterns, you're gonna probably make the guess that fluorine makes one bond, and the symbol color turns out to be green. And then here is the big moment. Can we predict how many bonds a neon atom will have. And remember, neon is the last element in the second row of the periodic table. It's the final element in this sequence, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, neon. Can you think about how many bonds a neon must make? Neons actually make zero bonds. There's really no 
color that's associated in a popular way with neon. I just kind of chose pink for neon. You can use pink if you want or some other color, but the pattern is true. Neon makes zero bonds. Neon's a noble gas, which means that it doesn't bond to any other elements generally, and that's why it has zero bonds. It's all because of this pattern. So let's go back to our periodic table and fill out the information that we have discovered ourselves actually from the periodic table. And we have kind of made a hypothesis which turned out to be correct about the number of bonds for some of these later elements. Hydrogens make one bond, carbons make four, nitrogens three, oxygens two, fluorine one, and neon zero. What you're looking at here is what I call the 43210 rule. And you're going to hear me talking all about the 43210 rule. This is a pattern that we see in the periodic table, and it's not just in this row of the periodic table. The next row also generally obeys this rule. Silicon, phosphorus, sulfur, re remember that sulfur made two bonds also. Chlorine and argon obey the similar rules. So we will actually learn all about that in the future lessons. But the main elements of life are what we see here, uh, at least carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and hydrogen. So it's good to know about this 43210 rule. When we're building the molecules with our kit, always obey the 4321 rule unless we know some other information to change the rule. Now that we've introduced the concept of atoms, let's try to connect the world of atoms with the world of cells. Cells are much larger than atoms, and cells are made of atoms. So now we're going to try to get uh, an idea of the scale of the micro world. So to see how small even these large protein molecules are, we're going to do this little exercise where we zoom into the slide of a microscope. This microscope slide has been prepared with a little sample of blood, and we're going to zoom in and see what we would see if we were looking through a microscope at different magnifications. The first magnification that we will see is 100 times life size. That sounds like a lot, but we still can't really see even the cells yet, and we definitely can't see any molecules. Let's zoom in a little bit more. We're going to zoom up to 200x, and now we do start to see something going on here. We do start to see some cells. Let's zoom up to 400 times life size. We can really see those red blood cells and a few other things. And at 1,000x, we get a very clear view of even the inside of some of these cells. This is also found in your worksheet here. So we're actually going to go ahead and label what some of these cells are just for the fun of it. We're going to label the red blood cells, which to me look like little jelly donuts. We're going to label the white blood cells, which because of a stain that was added, they actually look purple but that actually is a white blood cell. They're few and far between. And then there's also the platelets, which are these little purple fragments, and those are actually responsible for clotting and other things. So these are the three major kinds of blood cells that you'll find in the sample. But we're interested in zooming into a red blood cell. Like, what if we could zoom into a red blood cell and take a look at the hemoglobin? Now, if we could see inside of a red blood cell, it would be chock full of hemoglobin proteins. You can tell by the number on the top that there are over one quarter billion hemoglobin proteins inside every red blood cell. So that shows you just how small even a very large protein is. We can fit a quarter billion of them into one cell. I'm going to now render the molecule in a little bit of a different way. I'm going to show you the atoms as their full size. Now we can change this kind of parameters inside pymol to show either the bonds, sometimes the, it's useful to see the bonds, sometimes it's useful to see the full size of the atoms. This is the full size of the atoms. They're much more puffed out. It's a little bit harder to read this, but it is more realistic. The carbons, hydrogens, nitrogens, and oxygens are basically what make up this molecule. There's some sulfurs and some irons, but basically that's what makes up a protein. I'm now going to render the molecule in a little bit different way. I'm going to show its surface. I've left the colors on its surface because we can see where the oxygens are in red, where the nitrogens are in blue, but that's the closest we can get to a picture of hemoglobin. We can't actually take a picture of hemoglobin because light is way too big in terms of its wave to interact with proteins. We need to actually use x-ray light, not visible light, to see these proteins. So these structures are actually generated using x-rays, which we cannot see. I'm going to now change the color to red because this molecule is what makes our blood red. And I'm going to now show you where this molecule fits in on the grand scale of the cell. So this is a beautiful painting that's created by a scientist and illustrator, David Goodsell. He made a series of artistic renderings of what the cells might look like in terms of their proteins and membranes and other structures, other things that we're going to learn about in this course. So this giant ball on the left is part 
of a red blood cell. And you can see how many hemoglobins are really loaded into that red blood cell. That's the purpose of the red blood cell's existence, is to carry hemoglobins. On the right, we see the plasma outside the cell. There's a lot of antibodies out there and other proteins. The blue membrane in the middle is what separates the inside of the cell from the outside. So there's this huge world of proteins and molecules that we need to discover and learn about throughout this course. So we will learn about a lot of what we see here. But again, this is just an artistic representation of this nano world that we'll be studying in this program. Now here is the heme. Heme is the most important part of the hemoglobin protein. This is the oxygen carrying part of the molecule. We can see that it has at its center an iron. The iron is held in place by several nitrogens. And then there's a ring called the porphyrin ring, which keeps the whole thing in place. There's some other atoms and groups on this as well. How does the heme work? The iron has a bit of a positive charge. And you can actually build the central part of the heme. You can't actually build the whole heme, but you could build parts of this heme with your model kit. The iron has a positive charge, and we're going to learn about why it has a positive charge in later units. Oxygen, which we're breathing in, has somewhat of a negative charge because of these lone pair electrons, which are these uh, tan pieces sticking off. We'll also learn a lot about those in later units. When we have a negative charged molecule with a positively charged molecule, we get the tendency for attraction. And this is actually how oxygen hitches a ride in our blood. It hitches a ride right on that central iron. And it's actually that angle is correct also. And we're going to see this in a second, uh, kind of verified in the pi mol molecular modeling structure. So coming back to our pi mol view of hemoglobin, we're going to actually now find the most important part of hemoglobin, which is the heme. There's actually four hemes in the molecule. And to find them, we're going to use our scroll bar up here. We can actually move the scroll bar and explore the sequence. This is the amino acid sequence. We have to get into some later lessons to understand what that is. But all I want you to find now are the hemes, where it says HEM. That's one of the oxygen-carrying hemes. If I scroll over more, we'll eventually find another one. And there's two more later in the structure. Actually, might, might as well just show you all of them right now. Here's another heme. And then here is the fourth heme over here. We'll know, so as, as we select in the sequence, we can see that there's also a selection that happens in the structure itself. So there's four hemes that are making up the hemoglobin. What I'd like to do, though, is unselect them by clicking the black background and just click on this particular heme. That's the one I'm interested in finding right now. That's going to help me zoom in and find exactly where I want to go without having to search around too much. And we're going to use all the different mouse buttons to figure out where my heme is. I'm going to use my scroll wheel to isolate my field of view. I'm going to use my middle click of the uh, scroll wheel to center us on where I think the heme is. And we're going to peel away the other layers. Now, what we're noticing here is that the heme is a very unique area of the molecule. There's different things going on here than you probably noticed before. Uh, we never saw such an elaborate ring system. We never saw this central atom. The central atom is actually the iron of the heme. And when people talk about iron in your blood, again, this is the iron in the heme. What's the job of the, of the iron and what's the job of the heme? It's to carry oxygen gas. And there's my O2 gas sitting off on that little angle there. We'll notice that there's a little bit of a violation in the rules that I've given you. This oxygen here looks like it's bound to three different atoms. This is actually not a normal bond. This is actually a pretty weak bond. And it has to be a weak bond because this oxygen has to come on and off. That's the whole point of hemoglobin. It's to carry oxygen and, and unload it. So that's not really a, a typical bond, uh, even though Pymol shows it as a bond. Um, what I want to do is actually make sure that we're on the selecting state for residues. And I'm going to change the color scheme. I'm going to change my color scheme to have different color carbons. Let's change it to yellow carbons. That, that really is going to help my heme to stand out. So now I can really see where it is. And it's, it is occupying sort of an, the edge of the structure, but it's really a totally unique area of the molecule. And it has to be unique because it's carrying the oxygen. That's its special job, is to carry the oxygen. Now, this oxygen also has to be somewhat protected as it journeys through the bloodstream and in, 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 the, in the red blood cell. So there's something else that is uh, worth uh, noting, even in this beginning lesson on hemoglobin. It's that the heme and the oxygen are found in a little pocket on the surface of the molecule. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a zoom back here, and I'm going to render the surface of the molecule. And we do that by changing the selecting state to molecules. Now, you don't know this yet, but hemoglobin is made of four separate proteins. I'm going to select one molecule, two molecules, 
three molecules, and four molecules. I'm now going to right click and I'm going to show the surface. Now this is going to render the surface and that's kind of what the protein really looks like. It's kind of this blobby sort of shape. It's a globin sort of shape to it, a globular uh, structure. And now we notice that the hemes are kind of snugly packed into these little pockets here. And that's what's protecting uh, the heme and it's protecting the oxygen. So that's, that's where its binding site is, is what we call it. It's a, it's a heme binding site. And there's the yellow one that we were looking at before. Let's just go back and zoom up on our old friend over here and see how it looks. I'm gonna kind of peel away some of the surface. And we can see that the heme is nicely nestled in that beautiful little pocket and we can look at it from different angles but it really is hidden there and that's part of the secret of how the oxygen is carried. We can see actually here this is a nice one. We can see that it makes this kind of indentation in the surface as we peel and move the, the rendering of our surface we can really see that the, the heme is found in a, in a little pocket there and what, what's the only thing we see from the outside? We see these little oxygens peeking out. Uh, that are part of the heme, but we don't actually see the oxygen inside very well, and the iron is also very well hidden. So that is our little tour of hemoglobin. We're going to look at the structure uh, in more depth, but that's the uh, beauty of pi moles, that we can kind of answer these wonderful questions and explore the 3D structure of the proteins. So to review what we learned in that 3D environment, if we peel away most of the protein, we will find the heme molecules. The hemes have that central iron in an orange-brown color that's held in place by those four nitrogens. It's binding to the O2, the double-bonded oxygen molecule, up top. And that oxygen can bond and it can unbond fairly easily. And that's what allows the heme to first load oxygen and then unload it in the body where it's needed. So let's explore that a little bit more. Here's the 3D structure in case you don't have enough pieces to build your own heme. I thought I'd show it to you. Again, showing that oxygen loading on and loading off. And we're going to see those lone pair electrons are critical in how this works. The lone pair electrons provide some negative charge. The iron provides the positive charge and that gives the attraction between the iron and the heme. Now let's look more biologically how the heme really works. First of all, we know that that iron attracts the oxygen which is found near the lungs. That's why we breathe in is to bring oxygen into our bloodstream. Now how does it work? There's lots of oxygens in the area of the lungs. The capillaries around the lungs are filled with oxygen because oxygen is arriving fresh from the outside, from the atmosphere. All those oxygens are going to be attracted to the irons which are found in those empty hemes. The hemes of the hemoglobin that are coming to the lungs have been depleted or they're empty. They don't have any oxygen. So there's a space for the oxygen to bind. Let's watch that one more time. Oxygen from the air or really dissolved in the blood will find its way to that central iron. When the hemoglobin travels in the red blood cells to the other parts of the body, there's actually a lot less oxygen around. That causes the oxygen that's bound to the iron to unbind and find its way to the cells where it's needed for respiration. So the fact that the iron and the oxygen have a weak bond is really critical in how the oxygen is delivered. Again, one more close up showing how this all works. We have our oxygen which can bind and unbind to the iron. Now this is a great time to pause and try to model this with your model kit as well. You can't probably create the whole heme but you could at least create a simple model with the iron in the center, maybe four nitrogens on each side and show how the oxygen molecule bonds and unbonds, uh, especially if you add those lone pair electrons, you can simulate how this whole process works. Now there's one other interesting piece of the hemoglobin story. When oxygen bonds to the iron of the heme, it actually has a special effect that changes the structure of the entire protein. So the oxy form of the protein has a different structure than the deoxy form. Here's an animation that shows that change. Remember that oxygen is the blue color and the red heme is shown in the middle with its little orange iron in the center. And as the oxygen bonds, the whole structure of the protein changes and when it unbonds, the structure changes back. And this is really important in the biology of hemoglobin, how hemoglobin is able to bond and unbond, load and unload oxygen. You can read more about this on the Protein Data Bank's PDD101 website. There's actually so many wonderful articles that are created for the general audience about proteins. So I'd really recommend checking out this article in particular and also any other articles that might interest you. 
So now that we've familiarized ourselves with some very complicated biomolecules like hemoglobin, it's now time to go back to basics. We're going to get out our guided worksheets and we're going to try to either draw or build the following gas molecules. The purpose of this exercise is to teach us how to build and also to use the 4321 rule to come up with legitimate structures. The first molecule is the easiest, it's hydrogen gas. We know that hydrogen only makes one bond. So if we have a molecule that has two hydrogens, which is what H2 means, we have to have only one bond between the two atoms. If you're using the two hold hydrogens, don't use the second hole, just use one hole, and this is the kind of structure that we're going to see there. If you'd like to pause the video now and try to figure out the structures of carbon dioxide, nitrogen, oxygen gas, and fluorine, please do so now. There is a little bit of a hint on how to build these structures. Above some of the boxes, you see this hint, use the long bonds. There's two kinds of bonds in your kit. The short bonds are generally used for single bonds. The long bonds are used for double and triple bonds. So that's your hint. For carbon dioxide, nitrogen, and oxygen, you will need the long bonds. So let's go over how to build these molecules. If I was teaching this course in a school, I would actually let the students have some trial and error, make some mistakes, talk about the ideas among themselves to try to figure out how to build these. But it's nice to also know how I would go through this process of problem solving to figure out what these molecules really look like. The first molecule is hydrogen gas. Now hydrogen, you're going to have two choices in your kit. You have the two whole hydrogens and the one whole hydrogens. I recommend using the one whole hydrogens to start. The second whole is for another concept called hydrogen bonding, which we learn about in later units. So for now, just kind of put the two whole hydrogens off to the side and uh, realize that hydrogens actually never make two bonds. That second hole is for another purpose. So to build the hydrogen gas molecule, it's not very complicated. We really only have uh, one thing to do here. Here's our hydrogen gas molecule, one bond. Hydrogen makes one bond, and that's all. That one's usually not a problem. The problems come in when we have carbon dioxide. How do we deal with CO2, one carbon and two oxygens, while following the 43210 rule? What I would do is realize that we're going to use those flexible bonds. That's the uh, hint that's given on your worksheet. And carbon has to make four bonds. So this is what you should be starting with when you are going to build your carbon dioxide molecule. You need to use all four bonds. Don't just do two bonds. Um, yes, you can make a molecule that has uh, the structure that has CO2 in it, but you won't follow any of the rules. So if sometimes we see things like this, maybe without these bonds here, this is not a complete structure. We have bonds that don't go anywhere. We don't follow any of the 4321 uh, rules. So the flexible bonds are here to help us out. We're just gonna kind of connect these guys together. And this is gonna give us the true structure of carbon dioxide, which is uh, what's called a linear geometry. And uh, this is actually the true structure of carbon dioxide. It's a kind of a straight line, one, two, three atoms right in a row, just like that. The next molecule that we're going to be uh, looking at is nitrogen gas. That's the molecule that's all around us right now. Nitrogen, remember, has three bonds. How do we make a molecule that has two nitrogens but three bonds? That's kind of strange, right? Well, again, the hint is to use the flexible bonds. Um, you need to have all three in there. And don't get um, tricked by that th uh, fourth uh, empty hole. That's used for something else later. We'll deal with how that works uh, in later lessons. But for now, we're just using the simple 43210 rule. That's what we start with. When we have our extra nitrogen, the second nitrogen, how does this go? We can uh, obviously attach it here. Okay, we're attaching it here. Um, what do we do with these extra bonds? Have to make multiple bonds. Got a double bond. And we actually need a triple bond for this one. This um, basically follows the 4321 rule now. We have uh, two nitrogens, and each of those nitrogens has uh, three bonds attached, three bonds kind of shared with each other. That is the molecule that's all around us. That's what's uh, make, makes basically made up the, making up the sky, and this is the, mo most of the air pressure on us right now is caused by this little molecule right here. Uh, by, by now, we're kind of getting the um, into the flow of things, we realize that O2, oxygen gas molecule, we're going to also use those long, long flexible bonds. Don't get confused again by those other bonds. Uh, holes, don't put other things in there right now. We will learn what those do later. Um, although actually when we looked at the heme uh, molecule, we saw that those uh, lone pair electrons go in those extra spaces. So that's what those are for later on. But here's our O2 molecule, O2 gas. And then the simplest one uh, at the end is uh, F2, fluorine gas, and uh, that's usually not a problem for people. So to review, our carbon dioxide gas will have a structure like this. It's actually called a linear geometry, which means that the three atoms are in a straight line. 
The nitrogen gas will have this kind of a look to it. The oxygen gas will look like this. The fluorine gas looks like this. And we can't actually build a neon, so I just kind of gave you a pi mole rendering of a sphere. Neons are noble gases, so they actually don't make bonds to anything. And it would be very uninteresting to have a neon in your model kit because it wouldn't make bonds with anything. We're now going to learn how to draw these molecules the way a chemist would draw them. There's a tendency to try to draw the molecule as if you're creating an art project. You're going to kind of create a shaded sphere and try to draw the sphere and the bonds. Don't get into that habit. We're going to use the element symbols to draw pictures of these elements. We're going to draw H bond H. That is what is meant by a hydrogen gas molecule, H bond H. Carbon dioxide has a central carbon with two double bonded oxygens to it. And this is a great opportunity to use your colored pencils to emphasize the color coding. Nitrogen is simply two N's connected with a triple bond, three lines. Oxygen is two O's connected by two lines, which is the double bond. And then fluorine has only a single bond connecting the two fluorines. For a neon, you would just write any, and it would be understood that you are drawing a neon gas atom. We can also render these in Pymol, so that's more of a 3D shape. Don't try to draw these. Many students try to actually draw this. If I say draw a picture of carbon dioxide, they try to draw something like this. Don't draw circles and spheres. Just draw the C's and the O's and the N's. That's all a chemist needs to understand what these structures are meant to be. And now's a great opportunity to emphasize the 43210 rule. If we look at the carbon of the carbon dioxide, we remember that it's bonded to four things. The nitrogens of nitrogen gas have three bonds. Oxygen has two bonds, and fluorine has one bond. By the way, hydrogen also has one bond, and the neon also has zero bonds. So there's the 43210 rule played out in the model building exercise. Again, if you haven't already done so, label your periodic table with the 43210 rule. It's very, very clear to see that chemistry is all about patterns, and we're going to be finding even more patterns to gain more understanding of the chemical world in this course. It's now sometimes nice to go back and reflect on the heme. Now, when we look at the heme, we notice that all these rules are being followed. The 4321 rule is being followed. We see um, multiple bonds uh, in our carbons, uh, but they always have four bonds. We see nitrogens with three bonds, but we also see some nitrogens with four bonds. For example, this one in the middle here. So this 43210 rule is a great rule for getting started. It actually is the rule for neutral atoms. Um, if a molecule has uh, a different number of bonds, it means that it's charged. So this is all thing, these are all things that we'll uh, get used to later in the, in the course. But uh, for the most part, we do see the 43210 rule being followed. We see, an, uh, again, a strange violation here. It's not really a violation. It's just a subtlety that we need to learn. A carb, an oxygen with two bonds, but then also an oxygen with one bond. And you will notice things like that in the pymol uh, structures too. You'll notice that we generally follow the 43210 rule, but there are going to be a few things here and there that um, are seem to violate the rule. But uh, they're not really violations. They're going to be just uh, subtleties to the, to the rule and uh, actually makes chemistry very rich to understand uh, what's going on with those violations. We're now going to go through these gas molecules and learn a little bit more about what they actually are, starting with hydrogen. Hydrogen is a lighter than air molecule. It's made of very small atoms, so it actually floats in our Earth's atmosphere. It was used in the past to fill dirigible balloons to make lighter than air airships like Zeppelins. The problem with filling a balloon with hydrogen is that it makes the balloon very flammable. And we have disasters like the Hindenburg disaster where lightning struck the balloon and didn't just catch the balloon on fire, it actually created an enormous bomb because the hydrogen is extremely flammable in air. So how do we explain this kind of chemical reaction? Hydrogen mixed with oxygen doesn't normally explode, but if you add energy in the form of a fire or a spark, you'll get bonds forming and breaking, breaking and forming, and you will get new molecules created. What you'll notice is that as you break these bonds, you can reform them in a different way, and the molecule that we get is the molecule on the right side. If you look carefully at this molecule, you may be able to figure out the formula and also what the molecule is. So maybe pause the video and try to figure out what molecule this fire created. So let's check out how to do this fun little combustion reaction. There's so many opportunities for what I call handheld chemical reactions uh, using these model sets. So how did the Hindenburg explode? How does a hydrogen fire happen? Well, we have to have an oxygen atmosphere, and we also have to have 
some hydrogen molecules, right? So when these two guys get together, they actually don't usually react. We need to heat them up or give them a spark, add some energy. What is a chemical reaction? A chemical reaction is the formation and destruction of bonds, and often energy is released or taken in during this process. So let's see how we would actually simulate the combustion of hydrogen gas. Remember, combustion, chemical reactions, are bonds forming and breaking. So let's go ahead and break some bonds. Let's add some energy, and let's break the oxygen completely in half, okay? Now, let's take this hydrogen and break it in half as well. Let's break it up, okay? So now we have a broken up hydrogen, broken up oxygens. Let's form some bonds now, right? Let's form this bond here, okay? Let's take this other hydrogen, which also has to be broken up, break this one up, and now this atom is gonna connect with this bond, and now we have a new molecule. Let's take the leftover pieces from the other pieces here. We're gonna take our oxygen and connect and form more bonds that were um, need to be restored here. Now we have two new molecules. We started off with three molecules. Now we only have two. Now these molecules have a very famous formula. This molecule has one oxygen and two hydrogens, or two hydrogens and one oxygen. That formula, very famous one, H2O. So it's very surprising for people to realize that when you burn things, you uh, usually, or almost always, will get water molecules forming. And uh, there's no other explanation for what happens. We have these certain atoms that uh, went into this reaction. Certain molecules have to come out. Water is what's formed when hydrogen explodes. Notice that on the left side, we have two oxygen atoms. And on the right side, we have two oxygen atoms. On the left side, we have four hydrogen atoms. And on the right side, we have four hydrogen atoms. So this is just a rearrangement of the atoms in these molecules. Yes, the molecule on the right is water, H2O. It has two hydrogens and one oxygen, and there's two of them. That's H2O. So it's, again, very surprising that a fire or an explosion can create water. Luckily, today we have a safer alternative to hydrogen. We fill our balloons with helium. Because helium doesn't make any bonds, you won't actually get any chemical reactions if the balloon is ever struck by lightning. You may damage the balloon, but it won't actually explode like a bomb. We also use helium in our party balloons. Same thing, these are not dangerous anymore because helium is an inert, noble gas. It doesn't re react with oxygen, it doesn't explode. But it is still lighter than air because it's a very small, light element. Interestingly, the explosive combination of hydrogen and oxygen was used in the space shuttle. The liquid fuel tank of the space shuttle contained both oxygen and hydrogen. When these were mixed together and ignited, you would actually create an explosion. So the back of the space shuttle is actually like a little Hindenburg explosion. It's igniting oxygen and hydrogen together to make water vapor. And this is what's propelling the space shuttle into space. Incidentally, the solid fuel tanks of the space shuttle contain different chemicals, which combine in a different way to make a whole set of gases. And we'll actually be looking more at some of these molecules later in the curriculum. The next gas molecule that we built was carbon dioxide, also a very famous molecule. This is the molecule that we breathe out when we exhale. The carbon that we take in as food actually ends up as carbon dioxide that's exhaled through our lungs. I also wanted to quickly introduce some of the pure forms of carbon. The first and possibly most famous form of carbon is the diamond. Now a diamond can actually be one enormous molecule that's made of only carbons. If we zoomed into a diamond, we would see that it's made of only carbons. Each carbon has four bonds, which makes it extremely strong. And letting this animation run, we can get an idea of the 3D structure of the molecule. These rings that are created between the carbons are called adamantane rings, and they're very, very strong, very rigid, very hard to destroy. There's another form of carbon called graphite, also pretty famous. This is what our pencil tips are made out of. And graphite has a completely different structure from carbon. Graphite is very soft and it actually can be rubbed off onto paper to create writing. Why does this happen? The carbons in a graphite are arranged in layers and those layers are weakly bound to one another. So we see one layer here, the next layer, the next layer, but those layers are not well attached. So you could actually use some pressure to rub off the different layers and get a mark on a piece of paper as a result. So when you're using the pencil, maybe even right now, what you're doing is you are scraping off different layers of graphite to create this black layer of 
writing. And incidentally, pencils do not contain lead. That would cause a great health risk every time you use a pencil. The lead of the pencil is actually made of graphite and clay. The third form of carbon is the buckyball. Now buckyball is, has a funny name. It's actually named after Buckminster Fullerene who invented the geodesic dome. And this form of carbon is really beautiful. It's a molecular soccer ball. It has the same geometry as a soccer ball. All the carbons have four bonds. There's no other atoms, but it has a actually very similar structure to graphite, although we see some five-membered rings, some rings with five carbons, not just only six-membered uh, rings, rings with six carbons, but that's the structure of buckyball. And where do we find such a thing? The other name of the buckyball, by the way, is fullerene. Where do we find this kind of material? This is part of soot. So whenever we burn something, there's gonna be some carbon left over, and the soot from this steam train uh, some of the soot inside uh, is actually going to have fullerenes and other similar molecules that contain carbon. So these three forms of carbon, also known as allotropes, are shown here. We have the diamond, which has this very packed and kind of rigid and bonded structure that creates this three-dimensional crystal that's very strong. That's the carbon for the diamond. We also see the flat layers of graphite, which are weakly bound. Actually, we don't even see any bonds between those layers, right? Those layers are just kind of sitting on top of one another. So it just takes a little bit of pressure to rub those layers off, and that's what gives us writing. Even the word graphite means to write. And then the third allotrope of carbon are these buckyballs. And actually, this one is called C60 because there's 60 carbons inside, but there actually are larger versions. There's a C70 and some others that have more carbon. So that's another form or allotrope of carbon. Now I want to show you a couple of these carbon allotropes. Uh, the allotropes that I thought I'd show you are the diamond, because the diamond is very impressive in 3D when you build these models. You could actually build a small version of this with your model set. The very impressive thing about it is how tough and strong it is. It's because every carbon makes four bonds, so there's just a lot of um, force that's keeping these atoms together. And uh, this is the beautiful uh, adamantane rings that keep the, uh, the, the diamond together. The diamond is the strongest material uh, on Earth because of its bonds. The other allotrope that I have built here is the buckyball. Now this is definitely something that you're not going to be able to build with your kit unless you order a lot of kits. There are 60 carbons in this molecule and we are obeying the 43210 rule. If we look at everywhere we look, we see it, uh, that every carbon has a double bond and it also has two single bonds. So two plus two is four. Every carbon has four uh, bonds. Now, the interesting thing about the buckyball is that things can actually get stuck inside. So there uh, is a field of um, chemical physics that is involved in uh, using high pressure to squish things and get inside this uh, molecular soccer ball. The other interesting thing about this molecule is that it has very similar kind of bonding pattern to graphite. Now, I didn't actually have a graphite built right here. Uh, number one, I ran out of atoms. And number two, you really only appreciate graphite in its layered form. So graphite's actually a little bit more appropriate to look at in Pymol, which I do hope you, that you uh, do that yourself um, using the files that are available from the website. There's another interesting artificial allotrope of carbon or form of carbon called the nanotube. And this is an enormous field of high-tech research now to develop very high-tech, lightweight materials using carbon tubes. So these are basically graphite layers that have been folded in on themselves to make tubes. And this kind of materials are going to be used in the future for very high-performance, lightweight applications. Coming back to the gases we've built, nitrogen is all around us. It makes up most of the Earth's atmosphere and a phenomenon called Rayleigh scattering, which is what happens when nitrogen and oxygen interact with light, this is what gives us the blue sky of the Earth. So now you know about the structure of the gas which is all around you. We got very familiar with oxygen in this lesson. Oxygen, of course, is produced by plants. It's also a major component of our atmosphere. This picture is showing oxygen bubbling out of algae. When photosynthesis occurs, oxygen is actually the waste product. So the plants are simply getting rid of the oxygen that they don't need. We use that oxygen to breathe in, and that actually powers our metabolism. So there's this relationship between plants and animals in how we use our oxygen. Finally, fluorine gas. It's a toxic material. It's something that hopefully you will never have to deal with, but it's a kind of greenish yellow gas. The final gas that we looked at was neon, and neon is a noble gas which makes it perfect for use in these kinds of neon light fixtures. When you excite the atoms of neon with electricity, they'll actually glow this red color. So a neon sign is filled with excited neon. The last thing I like to do in this first lesson is to give the students an overall picture 
of the atmosphere. So this is a modeled version of the air which is all around us. It's about 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen, and a little under 1% argon. There is a small amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, but it's under 1%. When we inhale air, this is the picture you should have in your mind, mostly nitrogen, some oxygen, a little bit of argon, and a few other things. When we exhale, we add a little bit of carbon dioxide to the air. I would like you to pause the video at this time and think about how much carbon dioxide is in the air that we exhale. And it's okay to make a random guess here, but it's interesting to compare what you think we're exhaling to what the reality is. So actually, when we exhale, we're only exhaling about 5% carbon dioxide. There's actually not a lot of carbon dioxide in the air that we let out. You'll notice that the oxygen concentration is lower, but the carbon dioxide concentration is a little bit higher. So that's always a little bit surprising to people. I think people have this perception that we're exhaling a huge amount of carbon dioxide, but it's actually only a little bit. Now you've made it through lesson one, congratulations. Now it's the time to take that post-test, which is the same as the pre-test, see how some of the questions you had earlier may have been answered and how much more you know about elements, atoms, molecules, and cells. If you'd like to see some answers to these pre-test questions, these are some simple responses that I've given, but there's no right or wrong answer here. This is all about what you've learned, but I'm sure you've learned a lot and I'm sure you've made a lot of progress in getting through this first lesson. If you'd like some homework, check out these three questions. It's very important to practice drawing and understanding the bonding of hydrogen, carbon dioxide, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, and neon. This kind of sets the stage for understanding all the bonding that we'll be talking about in the program. Also, I'd like you to use your model set to create your own molecules that use the 43210 rule. And this is also a great time to practice drawing the molecules that you've built. Well, that's it for lesson one. Thanks so much for joining me. I hope you learned a lot, and I will see you in the next lesson.